Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to the New Books Network. I am Dr. Melik Fratalti, and I'm a musician as well as a neuroscientist. Today, I will be your host, and we will be talking to Dr. Trenton Holiday about his new book, Cro-Magnon, the Story of the Last Ice Age People of Europe, published by the Columbia University Press this year. Trenton Holliday is a professor of anthropology at Tulane University and honorary research fellow at the Center for the Exploration of the Deep Human Journey, University of the Witwatersrand. During the last ice age, Europe was the home of people physically indistinguishable from humans today, commonly known as the Cro-Magnons. This book tells the story of these dynamic and resilient people in light of recent scientific advances. Holiday offers new insights into these ancient people from anthropological, archaeological, genetic, and geological perspectives. He also considers how the cro responded to Earth's post-glacial warming almost 12,000 years ago, showing that how they dealt with climate change holds valuable lessons for us as we negotiate life on a rapidly warming planet. Fenton, hello, and welcome to this podcast. Oh, thank you. How are you? How's everything going for you? It's very well. It's morning here. I'm assuming it's afternoon there. So Yes, uh, it is. Yes. So I'm a morning person, so this works. <laughs> and I'm I'm an evening person, so it works for me even better. Um okay, so let's start with you first. Uh could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your professional background, your training? Sure. So I'm a paleoanthropologist by training. I'm a uh, professor of anthropology at Tulane University. I grew up in Louisiana, which is unusual for people here at Tulane, which is in Louisiana. There aren't that many old school Louisiana people here. I became interested in human evolution at an early age. Uh, I remember my mother telling me about the discovery of Lucy in 1974, when I was a wee lad, as one might say. And I decided to major in anthropology in college. I went to Louisiana State University for my undergraduate work. And human evolution fascinated me, but I became enamored with late human evolution in particular. And in investigating where to go to graduate school, I decided to go to graduate school at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, where I worked with uh, Professor Eric Trinkus, who was my mentor. And he's a bit of a Neanderthal expert. He just recently retired. And so I became enamored with the Neanderthals and modern humans, early modern humans, the origins of our species, Homo sapiens, uh, modern human origins, as it's called, and did that as my dissertation research. And I've worked on a lot of different time periods. I've worked with Australopithecus, um, but primarily I always come back to my first love in paleoanthropology, which is... Neanderthals, early modern humans like the Cro-Magnon and uh, modern human origins in Europe. So that's what the book is about. Exactly. And um, what made you write this book now? How did you get to get to start it? I, uh, I've been thinking about writing this book for a long time. I'm not in a book field. My field is a, a journal article field. And so writing a book was not a priority. <laughs> There were always other things I needed to do instead. But in the back of my mind, I really wanted to write a book on the Cro-Magnon. I thought that the Neanderthals had been overdone. They'd been done to death. And I thought that that the Cro-Magnon needed to have their story told. And I thought I could do it. And I think it was 2010, there was a book by Brian Fagan that came out called Cro-Magnon. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've been scooped. And I bought a copy of the book. And I put it on my shelf and I said, I guess I'm not going to write that book now. And eventually I got around to reading it and I thought, you know, he's telling a story, but it's a very different story than the one I would tell. And so I said, I don't think I've been scooped in the sense that my book would be a very different book than his, not to criticize his book, but we just came at it from very different perspectives. And when I finally had an opportunity to write the book, I received a year sabbatical in exchange for doing two terms as department chair, (laughs) which is a a dubious honor to be department chair. Once I had that year off and it happened to coincide with uh, the pandemic too. So it was kind of good timing. I was able to, to finally start putting this book together. And uh, 
just came out in July of 2023. And so if you were to put it in a nutshell, how would you describe your book, the Cro-Magnon book? So in a nutshell, I would say it's a book about the earliest modern people of Europe, their potential interactions with Neanderthals, their art, their lives, and trying to give a voice to people who whose story deserves to be told, but who cannot tell the story themselves. Wow. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about these um, earliest modern humans. Who are they? Where did they live? And are they different to us? So the earliest modern humans are in Africa. So I do have a chapter that is devoted to them. Um, the very earliest ones are around 300,000 years old. They're um, from Jebel Hood Cave in Morocco. Uh, they are different from us in a lot of ways. And in fact, some people wouldn't consider them to be modern humans. That's the problem with the term like modern humans is it means different things to different people. So this I, uh, wanna... uh, also, sorry, I'm interrupting, but this is, I think, also a very important thing to, to address, right? How do we describe the um, modern human? Right. Because I didn't want to put modern human in the title because I was scared that people would approach it and not know what the book was about. You know, some people might think it's about people in the 1950s or if one is an historian. You may think the book is about people in the 16th century. And so I wanted the title Cro-Magnon. No one calls early modern humans in Europe Cro-Magnon anymore. But I knew that the term would be re instantly recognizable and people would know I was talking about human evolution. So I use modern human as just a shorthand for Homo sapiens, our species. And in that sense, I think it works pretty well. Uh, in the book, I discuss how Chris Stringer, who's a paleoanthropologist at um, the British Museum, thinks that the Jibbler Hood specimen I was just talking about, the oldest potential member of our species, he says it's not modern in his anatomy. And I, I agree with him. It, it It lacks a lot of features that we would consider um, the features that are present in people today. Uh, but he does think it's a member of our species, Homo sapiens. And all the earliest Homo sapiens are from Africa. Interestingly enough, they're from all over Africa. So if we were conducting this interview, let's say 20 years ago, and we were advocates for the recent African origin model, we might say, oh, well, modern humanity emerged in one spot. East Africa, you know, 100,000 years ago, and then spread to the rest of the, of the world. The view is a little more complicated now because it looks like we have gene flow or exchange of genes among different populations across the African continent early on. And I think some researchers have actually taken to calling the recent African origin model African multi-regionalism which I hesitated. I don't want to use that term in my book because I don't want it to be confirmed with or confused, excuse me, with uh, multi-regionalism in general. But the modern humanity emerges in Africa. We're a, a separate species, but I don't believe that means we're reproductively isolated and no one does anymore. Um, do you want me to explain what that means or? Yes, if you like, yes. So um, reproductive isolation is an idea that dates back to Ernst Meyer, who is a Harvard biologist or was a Harvard biologist. He died at age 100 about a decade ago. He had a, a long history of defining species as groups of uh, or populations of individuals who are reproductively isolated from other such populations. And reproductive isolation, when you can see it, it actually define species pretty well. So horses and donkeys, members of the same genus, but they interbreed to produce mules, for example. Mules tend not to be able to reproduce themselves. And as a result, um, horses and donkeys are reproductively isolated from each other. They're two separate populations. In my book, I point out that, you know, biology is really messy. It's, it's not always so neat. And there are groups that I think are legitimate species that nonetheless retain the ability to interbreed with each other. And we know from ancient DNA that Neanderthals and early modern humans 
interbred with each other successfully, and that most people around the world today carry at least some Neanderthal genes. Indeed. And how did these uh, modern humans then leave Africa? And uh, where do we find their remains outside of Africa? So they they leave Africa probably through um, the Sinai. There's also a possibility that they cross the, oh my goodness, I can't believe I can't think of the strait between between Yemen and the Horn of Africa, the Bob or something, I'm sorry. Um, they might leave through uh, into Southern uh, Arabia that way. Uh, the earliest humans, modern humans, I should say, or Homo sapiens that we find outside of Africa are found in the Southern Levant in what's now um, Israel, uh, Lebanon, um, Palestine, that sort of area in there. Uh, there is some evidence that modern humans might be present around 200,000 years ago in Greece. There's a, a specimen from Apodema Cave that um, some suggest has some suggestions of modern human uh, morphology in the back of the cranium. Unfortunately, the face is missing, which I think is key to uh, modern humans. But the earliest modern humans outside of Africa are in the Near East at about 200,000 years ago. And then we find them in China as early as, say, 120,000 years ago. So Homo sapiens expands outside of Africa relatively quickly, as far as we can tell, um, to most places. We don't find much evidence of them in Europe early on, the possible exception of this uh, site in Greece, Apodema. And the Cromagnons, as you said, are based in Europe, right? So um, how do we know what we know about them? Um, could you tell us a little bit about the discovery of the of the remains? Of the original Cromagnon remains? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a fun story. Um, so the the Cromagnon rock shelter is in a little village called Les Aizy. And they were building a railroad and wanted to build a new train station for Les Aizy and needed to build a road to the new train station. And so in 1866, they um they started blasting away um using dynamite, also shoveling away some of the remains, some of the sediments, I should say, that were inside this rock shelter. And in the process of removing uh, this sediment to build this road, workers found human remains, uh, beads, like pierced shell beads, and um, evidence of, of stone tools. And they uh, were... Fortunate enough, they they contacted some folks who came out to investigate, who looked at the material, realized its significance, and brought out a young um, paleoanthropologist by the name of Larte, Louis Larte, who came out and investigated the site. A lot of it had, material had already been removed by the time he got there, but he verified that it was an ancient site, that these were hunter-gatherer, pre-agricultural people. Um, and they were anatomically modern or nearly anatomically modern in their anatomy. You asked me earlier, and I don't think I answered the question. They look like us, basically, these early modern humans. They were more muscular than we are on average. They had uh, bigger faces than we do on average, maybe a little bigger brow ridges on average. But I, you would never, if they were dressed in a modern fashion on a subway, they wouldn't call attention to themselves other than you might say, well, that's a pretty big person. Um, and when we look at them in terms of analyzing their morphology, they don't always fall within the range of people today. And I had actually had a section in the book that was an analysis of, of the morphology of, of modern humans or recent humans, thousands of recent humans, and looked at some of the early Cro-Magnon in relationship to that. And they fell outside the modern uh, range of variability, which why would we expect something that is 30,000 years old to look exactly like people to do today? So it, I thought it was an interesting section. One of the reviewers, preprint reviewers of my book said, uh, I, the, the more I read this section, the less I like it. I think you need to pull this out. Your readers aren't going to want to read a bunch of 3D morphometrics. So I did pull that section out of the book. I may publish it somewhere else um, because I was trying to write a book that would appeal 
to a more general audience. I, I I'm didn't want to very just curious talk to now, though. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what sort of differences you found when you did this comparison? Yeah. So, uh, for example, there's there's a site in uh, the Czech Republic called Mladic, and some of the individuals from Mladic had very long low crania. You know, our crania are more globular. They tend to be high. We have high foreheads. They're sort of short from front to back. Um, Mladic had a much lower, longer lower cranium, which is a plesiomorphic, or I hate this word, primitive retention that um, our earlier ancestors had. Our, the sort of globular cranium is a more derived or apomorphic um, characteristic. And uh, in particular, the, the back end of the cranium was extended a little bit, almost like an occipital bun, which is a Neanderthal characteristic. So an occipital bun, or in French, they call it a chignon, like the little hairdo, like if you put a bun on the back of your head, um, this specimen actually had that. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, perhaps we could say I, they haven't been able to extract DNA from this specimen as far as I know. Um, but one might say, oh, perhaps this, there was a recent Neanderthal ancestor of Mladic. So some of the material falls within the range of modern humans today in sort of its overall shape. Uh, some of the material fell outside of it because it had these retentions, these primitive retentions of uh, a longer lower cranium and perhaps a bigger face as well in some cases. So one thing that I find really fascinating and I think uh, some of the listeners would also be interested in knowing this is how did the Cro-Magnons live on a day-to-day -day basis? What would they eat, for example? Or how, where would they stay, live? Um, how were their relationships with one another? Do right, we so know think, anything about this? We know a little bit. And some of it is analogous to modern-day hunter-gatherers, which is always a slippery slope. But we do have evidence of their food remains. There's long been a bias towards animal remains, just because... Those are easier to study, easier to see. So we know that they they hunted um, big game. Some of them seem to be focused almost exclusively on one prey animal. There are sites in southwestern France, for example, and central France as well, where they're hunting almost exclusively reindeer. In some places, they're hunting almost exclusively mammoths, um, which is a dangerous occupation, I would think. Uh so we focus on the big game, which played an important role in the diet as far as we can tell. But we also have evidence for them exploiting fish such as salmon. Um, and we have relatively recently, within the last decade or so, discovered mortars and pestles with the remnants of plant materials on them, which suggests that they're actually grinding um, nuts, roots, seeds into a flower. Um, which is something that you tend to associate flour with agriculture. So we know they were eating plant foods as well. Um, plant foods aren't available for a lot of the year in glacial Europe. This is during the last ice age. So it's a lot colder in Europe than it is today. Um, and so you expect the plant foods to only be available certain times a year. Perhaps they're eating the gut contents of, of um, some of the herbivores they kill. That might be a way of getting those uh, the nutrition that plants provide, humans crave, um, in an environment where it's not readily available all the time. And then during the spring, perhaps they're able to store um, some of the the foods that they uh, plant foods that they were able to to get a hold of. There are there's a little evidence of storage pits, um, not a lot. And also in some places, it looks like they're living in what is essentially villages year round and other sites seem to be uh, seasonally occupied. And those sites can be in, in rock shelters. We tend to find uh, remains in caves and rock shelters because those are ideal for preserving artifacts. But we also know that they lived in open air sites as well and built structures, huts, if you will. So, Life revolved around hunting and gathering. Uh, there may have been times a year where they came together in very large numbers. Again, this is sort of making analogies with 
modern day hunter gatherers that um, during times of plenty, maybe during the summer, large groups of people could come together for games, uh, music, um, contests, just kind of a festival feast type atmosphere. Um, we imagine that that early modern humans would have done that as well. And um, how about the spoken language and tool making skills? What do we know about these in relation well, spoken, to chromions? Spoken language is a tough one because it doesn't fossilize. For sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you as a neuroscientist know that a lot of what causes language or allows language, we're not going to find in the fossil record, right? There was arguments in the 1970s, for example, that Neanderthals couldn't speak um, the same way we can based on reconstructions of their throat. But one cannot really reconstruct the throat from the hard tissues. There's just too much play in that area. And maybe they had inability to pronounce certain vowels. It, it, there are people who've done that kind of work. Um, the bottom line is, and this is an eternal problem in paleoanthropology, we know we come from ultimately animals that were non-linguistic. We know in terms of cognition that we come from animals that lacked the cognitive capacity that we have the problem is trying to go to the fossil and archaeological record and figuring out when these things emerged because they don't fossilize some people say art if you have evidence of art figurative art in particular then that implies language other people say the complexity of a tool if you're making um you're making stone tools that have a certain amount of complexity it would be nearly impossible to learn how to make them just through observing another individual making them. But there has to be um, some kind of language involved in the transmission of that technology because their technology is um, very sophisticated, um, quite sophisticated technology, both in terms of clothing, uh, the evidence for tools that we have. Um, these are complex societies Uh, in terms of their technological capacities. And th their technological capacities might, in fact, surprise uh, many of the general readers out there. Because we tend to think, you know, we have all of these, the, we stand on the shoulders of giants, we have lots of technology, um, and we tend to think that people in the past uh, didn't have sophisticated lives. Uh, these folks did. And so I think ultimately that they did have language. Uh, that's a sort of roundabout way of answering your question. So do do we know if there is a cultural exchange between the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons? And would this somehow contribute to the technological advancement of, of them? Um, what's the evidence for and against? So there's there are some who suggest that... Um, There's very little evidence of culture exchange between these, these two forms of human. Uh, there are others who look at uh, what are known as initial Upper Paleolithic industries, IUP, um, which are industries that appear, at the earliest we have is about 54,000 years ago in Southern France. Most of the IUP, initial Upper Paleolithic industries are 45,000 to 40,000 years ago. And then there's a huge debate as to who's making them, right? Some, some of the IUP looks to have been manufactured by Neanderthals, but then there are people who say it's not Neanderthals. And then if it's manufactured by Neanderthals, is it manufactured in response to the technology of the cro -Magnon? Are they looking at the cro technology or acquiring some aspects of Cro-Magnon technology and either imitating it or acquiring something through trade and making it their own. It's really hard to see. We have such an incomplete archaeological record and it's a long time ago. Um, even some of the arguments I make in the book now uh, are, are kind of, I'm a little, I'm a little frightened because a paper just came out. It always happens that after you write a book, a paper <laughs> comes out. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Bruno Moray, is an author on the paper, and so he sent it to me. I, I make the argument in the book, and I, I do say in there that I'm not convinced that this is true, but I say I think the Shadow Peronian, which is a 
IUP, initial upper paleolithic industry. I think Neanderthals manufactured it. And at the time I wrote the book, I said, you know, the only human remains that are associated with the Shadow Peronian so far are those of Neanderthals. And so I said, you know, this is far from certain, but I think I side with people who suggest this industry, this kind of complex upper Paleolithic industry is made by Neanderthals. And, you know, I guess it was two months ago, this article came out where they analyzed a juvenile uh, pelvis, or at least an, an os coxae, a hip bone, uh, from a shadow peronian layer, and now from deep in a shadow peronian layer, and it's a modern, it's an anatomically modern uh, pelvis. So it, the shadow peronian, is it made by both Neanderthals and modern humans? Is, is uh, this thing intrusive somehow that we've missed some kind of uh, mixing of the levels when cave bears come into a cave, for example, and this is from a site called Guad du Guen, which is a reindeer cave. The cave bears going in there and digging up and mixing things together, but usually archaeologists can tell when something's been mixed, and this is very low. And then the most frightening possibility, I mean, it's frightening and it's exciting at the same time, is what if this is, um, what if there were modern humans associated with earlier technologies, what are known as middle Paleolithic technologies, we know that modern humans, anatomically modern humans, are associated with those in the Near East. What if some of these Mousterian or middle Paleolithic technologies in Europe that we say, oh, well, it's middle Paleolithic in Europe, Neanderthals are responsible for it. What if some of those are actually manufactured by modern humans? Um, if, if you had to ask me what the most exciting development that came out when I was writing this book, it came out in 2022, um, and it was the work of Ludovic Slimak, who is a, a French paleoanthropologist or an archaeologist. He has a new book out. I don't know if you all are going to profile his book called uh, The Naked Neanderthal. I haven't read it yet. Um, but Slimak is, has been Thanks working on Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> yeah, you should. I mean, I haven't read it, so I'm assuming it's good. I should read it. But he had a paper that came out. Um, he's been working at a site in the Rhone Valley uh, called Mandran Cave. And at this site, he has, there's a, a layer uh, of tools, initial upper Paleolithic tools, called the Neronian. It's been known for a long time, the Neronian. Uh, and then it was always a mystery as to who was responsible for it. Well, using multiple dating methods, he looks at this layer of the Neronian, and it seems to be a very brief foray at 54,000 years ago. And they found some deciduous teeth or baby teeth in there that are anatomically modern in morphology. There's no evidence of cultural exchange. The Neronian is really shockingly complex. And there's multiple layers of middle Paleolithic, what we assume are Neanderthals, again, below. And then there are a bunch of middle Paleolithic layers above. And it looks like this is a very brief incursion of Homo sapiens into Europe 54,000 years ago. It was much earlier than we had thought. So in, as recently as 2021, the earliest modern humans we thought are about 46,000 years ago in Bulgaria. And then here comes this paper saying 54,000 years ago, we have a brief incursion of modern humans into Southern France. It had, you know, I did have to revise a lot of parts of my book as things would come out. This had downstream effects in almost every chapter of my book. And I'm so <laughs> glad it came out that I was able to address these because it would have been so frustrating to have to deal with this. Um, but it's an amazing how many of these little incursions of modern humans might have happened over tens of thousands of years that we won't pick up archaeologically. You know, it's just you have to have a, a presence to for us to be able to find this material, we have to be lucky that it's preserved, but it gives you pause. I mean, for me, the, the take home message, of course, and it's a message I happen to like, is that modern humans are not so superior to the Neanderthals that they just waltz into Europe, you know, kill them all or outcompete them all 
and establish themselves immediately. In this in this particular cave, they come in very briefly at 54,000 years ago, and then they're gone for another 10,000 years until they finally come back 44,000 years ago. I just wonder how many of these quasi invasions or at least incursions of, of Homo sapiens into Neanderthal country, if I can call it that, happened over tens of thousands of years. To me, it's a, a fascinating idea. To me as well. And um, I think uh, paleoanthropology is just an amazing, amazing field. Um, you just hope to discover something to, to rewrite the <laughs> history. <laughs> yes. Right. So I, I, I also find it very interesting um, how the Cro-Magnons uh, adapted to the climate change of their time. And this is obviously a very relevant topic to our time. Could you elaborate a little bit on this? How did they manage? Sure. So, I mean, I, I, I have a chapter... Um, one of the recent reviews of the book suggests, oh, I wish, you know, I wish it had been earlier in the book, but I guess it works where it is. The last chapter of the book, I talk about climate change and I talk about it both in terms of when climate got really cold, the last glacial maximum, when the Cro-Magnon were living in, in Europe. And I talk about when Europe warmed up again at the end of the last glacial. And in many ways, I think the latter, which has sort of real world implications for us today, a warming planet, I think that was actually much more difficult for the Cro-Magnon to deal with than the cold. So I, I talk about in the cold, what you see is there's an improvement in pyrotechnology. They build harves where they, they put, they line the harves with rocks and the rocks absorb the heat um, during the night and then radiate that heat out. Um, there's things in archaeologists called fire cracked rock, which shows up from this sort of repeated cycle of heating and cooling that occurs. In some cases, they have tunnels dug to the hearth to channel oxygen to the fire to make it burn hotter. We have eyed needles. Now, the first one of those appears at Denisova Cave about 50,000 years ago. And Denisova Cave is an important site in southern Siberia. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised that tailored clothing became a more of a necessity in Siberia earlier than it was in Europe, but it makes its way to Europe. And during the prior to the last glacial maximum, this, this time period where the last or the coldest, I should say the coldest period in the last 120,000 years, roughly from about 26,000 years ago to about 18,000 years ago, there we find evidence that people are using eyed needles. They're tightly stitching clothing. There's evidence of trapping mustelids. Um, weasel family, ermine, and that kind of uh, animal. One could stitch those hides very, they have warm, you know, fur that keeps one very warm. You can imagine them also stitching hides of reindeer, reindeer, depending on where they're living. We find evidence of, of hard soled shoes, at least in terms of their the bones of their feet, look as if they were wearing hard soled shoes. Um, Almost certainly they wore gloves. And then the modifications they make at sites that are in rock shelters or caves where it looks like they draped um, hides at the entrance of these caves to sort of keep the heat in. And then they look like they might have had hides and little walls internally within caves, almost like rooms. Perhaps you can think of them as one family unit sort of walling itself off from the other family units within a rock shelter or a cave. And in all of those things help keep the heat within the cave itself, which is going to be really important during the last glacial maximum. I point out, it looks like most of Northern Europe was largely abandoned during the last glacial maximum. There almost certainly were groups who went extinct as a result of this. But we have a real increase in places where I've worked. I've done some archaeological work in Portugal. The Iberian Peninsula is like a refugium of Cro-Magnon people retreating as the temperature gets really cold. And southwest France looks like it was a refugium as well. In other parts of the Mediterranean, um, people were able to survive while largely abandoning um, Europe north of the Alps. In terms of the climate change at the end of the Ice Age, 
the biggest problem is that it brings reforestation. And I, I say in the book, there's a reason forests are viewed as dangerous places in sort of German folk tales or the tales you tell your children, fairy tales. Um, it's a tough place for humans to make a living. The animals in forests tend to be smaller. They tend to be um, more solitary. So they're harder to find. Most of the food in a forest is um, in small packages, both animal and plant food. Most of the productivity of the plants is locked in things humans can't eat, like trunks of trees. Um, I mean, there are resources in forests, but a forest itself is not an easy place for humans to eke out a living. And so when Europe becomes reforested, uh, one of the first things we see is it looks like there might have been a population decline. The sites get smaller, which suggests there are fewer people at these sites. Ultimately, they have to expand their diet to a lot of foods that they may have previously ignored. Um, shellfish have to focus on hunting game in a forest. The bow and arrow uh, really takes on prominence in that environment because it's a surgical weapon. You're likely to be closer when you're, well, you have to be closer in a forest to um, hunt an animal and, and successfully hit it with a projectile. Um, so, I mean, we know that ultimately uh, many people survived in Europe. There was obviously waves of, of agricultural people who came in afterwards. And there's some evidence of Cro-Magnon, genetic evidence of the descendants of Cro-Magnon at least adopting agriculture as well. So um, that's another fascinating story that was you know, sort of too much for this book, but the sort of agriculture coming in and these agricultural groups cutting down trees and planting crops and with their cattle or goats or sheep uh, is sort of a fascinating idea. And if, if I ever write a novel, I think I'll write a novel about about that <laughs> time period <laughs> with hunter gatherers and, and agriculturalists in Europe. Uh, I think there's a lot of, it's an interesting story there as well. Actually, this brings me to, to my next question very nicely. Um, what are you currently working on? Is this your next project, for example, a novel or another a book? Or... <laughs> I do. I do. You know, writing this book has been fun and I didn't, know that I would enjoy writing a book as much as I did. I mean, it's work, obviously, um, but it was fun. And I didn't write it to make money. <laughs> it's just, you know, don't quit your day job. Um, my next book, I think I'm going to go back earlier in time. My next book, I'm uh, another sort of fascinating time period for me. So this is about the origins of Homo sapiens, this book. Um, and, you know, I focus primarily on kind of after the, the origin of Homo sapiens in Europe, but I, I'm fascinated by the origins of the genus Homo as well. And I think there's a, a story to tell with the sort of late Australopithecus, early Homo, the emergence of, of our genus, and then the spread of Homo outside of Africa, the expansion of Homo outside of Africa, which I think is another um, fascinating topic. It doesn't look like Australopithecus. Almost certainly the genus Homo is derived from the genus Australopithecus. It doesn't look like Australopithecus ever expanded outside of Africa. It looks like Homo is the first. Now, big dispute as to which species of early Homo made it outside of Africa. And some of the earliest evidence we have of humans outside of Africa is archaeological and not paleontological. There's some sites in China with 2.1 million year old stone tools, and we don't know what species made them. But that's that's the, the next story I thought I'd like to tell. So it's much earlier in time. Um, an origin story of sorts, or, origin of Homo sapiens is the one I, I told this time, and then origin of the genus Homo for the, the next project. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so this has been a fascinating discussion, and thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, sure. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the book, and it's been fun to discuss it with you. And it's been fun to read it as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you.